already. It seemed to have slowed down. So I think we're good to just go ahead and get started and we'll allow others to just trickle in if needed. Um, as I mentioned before, thank you guys so much for joining. We really appreciate your time and you being here. For those of you who have returned from the other two sessions that we have had the past two weeks, we really appreciate you coming back. So welcome back. Um, and if you have not, just as a quick overview, so this whole series has been around Google Workspace for Education. In the first session, we viewed all of the different paid versions, um, and we went over a high-level overview of each version and what they entail, and just a very, very quick overview of the price that's associated with each. And then for the second session, we went over some of more the teaching and learning um, additional features and functionalities with Google Workspace for Education. Um, and then just overall went into a little bit more detail of the features that come along with some of the different paid versions. And then for this session, um, our intention is to now focus on some of the additional security features. So if you did miss out on the past two sessions and you are interested, they are available as a recorded session that you can um, view at your own leisure. So please let us know if that's something that you would like to get a hold of if you um, were not able to join us live or are interested. And with that being said, I am pleased to um, introduce over to some great resources we have with Five Star and I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Oh, wait, I should actually introduce myself first, sorry. So I'm actually Jocelyn Fallon. I am the Google brand manager that is internal to Bloom. Um, so again, just the internal resource in Bloom for any um, questions or um, truthfully anything that falls under the Google for Education category. And with that being said, now I'll hand it over for some more introductions. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, my name is Billy Bass, and I am the Director of Marketing for Five Star. And today we're also joined by Five Star System Engineer, Jason Jones. Jason is going to be doing the bulk of the speaking today. I'm just the uh, quote unquote pretty face that will guide you through these uh, slide decks before we get into the, the nitty gritty here. So um, today we're going to dive into a little bit more about understanding Google Workspace for Education. As Jocelyn said, you know, we've had a couple of different webinars already that touch on different elements of it, but Jason is going to take you inside the admin console and behind the scenes into Google Workspace so you can get an idea of exactly how to unlock some of those features, talk specifically about security, the admin console, and more. Um, as we said, we're going to dive into that right here. And it's going to be a really great opportunity for you all to ask any questions uh, about some of the specific topics that Jason is going to cover. So we're going to move from Google Classroom into Google Meet, into Google Drive, and then finally the admin console. After each section here, uh, Jason will offer it up for questions. Um, and so feel free to throw those in the chat. Jocelyn's going to be watching the chat for us. Um, and we'll, we'll have some time at the end as well, uh, if you'd rather save it for the end. So that being said, Jason is uh, a master at what he does and what he knows. So if he does his job right, which I know he will, you probably shouldn't have any questions. Um, but before we get started, uh, we wanted to throw up a poll just to kind of gauge your experience with Google Workspace for education. So Jocelyn, feel free to launch that poll now. So we want to know, do you have no experience with Google Workspace for Education as far as the admin console goes? You have some experience or you are very experienced. So feel free to throw those answers uh, in that poll. Uh, and then I'm going to throw it over to Jason to stop sharing my screen so that he can get ready and dive into everything. I'm very upset that I'm not allowed to vote in that poll. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'm Jason Jones. Um, I'm a systems engineer with Five Star, uh, dealing with pretty much everything Google. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we're going to run through today that is pretty much uh, kind of a broad overview of what you get with that licensing. Um, let's see. My green box isn't popping up. Can you see my screen okay, Billy? Yes, you're sharing loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So with everything we have to cover today, um, we're going to have a brief overview, but then if you have any questions, anything a little bit more specific, um, I do a lot of these with one-on-one -on -one style. So just feel free to go on ahead and throw those in there. And if I don't see them, then Billy will hit me up and we'll get those answers for you. 
And Jason, right. just so you know, the results of that poll, if they didn't come through, it looks about like 80% of our folks have some experience uh, with Google Workspace. Well, if you have some experience, you're an expert if you work in IT. So congratulations on all the experts in the room. Um, we're going to go over today. Thankfully, the group last week did a really awesome job of covering a lot of stuff with um, classroom and meet and diving into this, that stuff a little bit more. Um, so we're just going to have a brief overview first. Um, here is the standard um, Google for Education uh, edition comparisons. Um, so if you've looked through this at all, it can be a little bit confusing just because there's so many different versions with fun fundamentals, standard, teaching and learning, and education plus. So whenever you're looking at this, it can be pretty much summarized with education standard is all of your security stuff, your extra reporting, your sandboxing, all that stuff's in standard. And then the teaching and learning upgrade is going to be your daily driver stuff for your teaching and staff. And that is like your meet extras, the classroom extras, and then Education Plus is just a meshing of all those things together. So you get everything. And um, these two in particular are going to be a lot more important with the teaching and learning upgrade and Education Plus because Google has announced that they're doing a lot of stuff with Classroom this year. So that's super exciting. Um, we should have more details as we get into Q2, hopefully rolling into Q3, but super exciting stuff. Um, We'll share this sheet if you need a copy of it. It's it's out there for everybody to see. And uh, as you go through, it shows you all the different things like what we talked about, you know, with the standard things like, you know, your practice sets, your rostering, originality reports. You're not going to get that with the standard. You're going to pick up more of the security side of things um, as we go down through here. Same way with like the polling, hand raising, all your meat features. That's going to be on your education side. So if it's stuff that the teachers use daily, you can pretty much assume that it's going to be in the teaching and learning upgrade. And if it's stuff on the back end with like your access, um, extra support features, you know, your some of your extra stuff like your mobile management, your context where access data regions, which you probably won't get into a whole lot. That's all on standard. Um, but a lot of our schools are primarily going education plus because they like all of it. <laughs> they like having the extra security, the extra reporting, and obviously the teachers love having all the extra features inside of Google Meet and uh, with Drive and Classroom. So we're going to go over a couple things today with Classroom. Um, if anybody has any questions about any of the licensing and stuff, feel free to shoot that in there. We deal with a lot of this, a lot of little licensing quirks and different things. Um, and we can also, we're not going through it in this specific setting, but we have a lot of times um, where there's multiple ways that you can do your licensing and applications. So um, if need be, I believe you can just reach out to Jocelyn for that and uh, we can get that squared away, hopefully get a session with you. So the first thing we're going to do inside our admin console here is kind of hit on the originality reports. And one of the things that was discussed last week was um, getting in there for those school matches where it goes through the drive data. And so that way you don't have kids sharing stuff or we've even <laughs> had cases of kids profiteering off of um, some former homework that they had that keeps on getting assigned every year by a staff member. And so if you go into your workspace classroom settings for originality reports, this is pretty much the only thing here is where you can enable those school matches. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and like all Google settings, usually it's instant, uh, could take up to a few minutes. Um, unless you're making big changes as far as routing and stuff like that, then you get into stuff that takes a little bit longer. And before we go ahead, um, Google has these little purple flags all over the place inside the admin console. And these are handy because it tells you exactly which licensing you have to have for this particular thing. So you can see that users with fundamental licenses, they're enabled, <clears throat> school, enable originality reports, school matches by default. And you can toggle this on and off only if you have the plus licensing. So it's going to give you the details on all of that. And the one thing Google is super good about is having their learn more that links to support articles. So wherever you see this learn more and you don't know how something needs to be configured or you have other questions, just click on that. And those support articles are super, super helpful. I know because sometimes I still look at them <laughs> because there's so many changes and they are 
fairly good at getting that support documentation updated. Um, rostering, I know that some of you were interested in that. If I could copy the right thing, here we go. And so this is set up with Clever, and that's you know importing your class rosters into your classroom to connect your school stuff. Um, we'll go over like the uh, the grade export side of things as well. And again, this is pretty basic on what you do in the admin side of things. You know, you can turn on your Clever, and then it has the additional details that you have to set up everything on Clever, so you can get that rostering taken care of. Um, we won't do a deep dive into that today, but if you click on Learn More, or if you have other questions, you can reach out to Jocelyn for that. Um, super handy, especially with what they're doing um, now, getting all of that stuff synced up. We kind of talked about Google becoming the source of truth for a lot of things. I know that uh, as far as LDAP and some things, it's not there, um, but they really are trying to make it to where everything gets set up and everything goes through Google and you don't have to worry about anything else, which we'll kind of go through today with some of the Windows options. Um, great exports. Same thing, it'll take you to this site and then you pick your poison and it goes through um, the, the uh, learn more tab has a lot more of that stuff in there. Um, it's not based out of Google. You pretty much turn it on and then you set it up and, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and you work that stuff through Clever. And then if you're doing your grade exports, so you can actually pull it out from Classroom back into your SIS. Um, so that's what this is. So, but if you need any more information from that, just let us know. Um, it's pretty awesome with some of the features and they're planning on actually improving upon this even more with the Classroom updates that are happening this year. Does anybody have any questions on the Classroom side of stuff? Speak now or forever hold your peace. I see Billy's beautiful face. Yeah, I think we're good right now, Jason. All right, perfect. So we'll go on ahead and go into Meet. Um, first off, we'll get some of the admin console settings here. Um, there's, a, there's a lot uh, with Meet, and you have to especially be careful with these um, just because um, thing I, I've seen several clients that we've messed with go into um, basically having everything turned on for everybody in their entire domain. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're especially careful with everything that you're doing for your user accounts. So, you know, your staff will be able to go in and have their um, video calling and everything turned on, but students, you will want that turned off. Um, so, and all the settings are in here too. If you go into the side over here to apps, this is where you're going to live at. So you go into your, your meet settings, it'll bring you up to the main page, same way with Gmail, anything else, all that stuff is coming from the side there. And so it's kind of split up. The settings are a little bit different. Um, just because for example, safety settings, the polls and the Q&A are inside there. Um, but all of this is, is OU based. So if you have anything as far as like joining quick access by default, that's a good one. Because um, this is basically the button that makes you uh, your teachers have to allow people to hop into the room. Um, if ever anybody remembers towards the beginning of COVID, um, whenever Google Meet started getting really big, um, there were a lot of issues of people getting links and just jumping into Meets and causing chaos. Um, so, but the new quick access features, those are by default and I would just leave them on obviously, and you get into some more security stuff, you know, who can join your meets, um, who has access to those, you know, whether or not chats turned off, and you might have specific groups that this works for. In general, um, you know, obviously you want your student presentation and everything off, but, but chat on, but then staff and everybody else, you can usually just go with the default settings because those are gonna be, gonna be uh, fairly standard across the board. And then same way with recording, obviously you want that turned off for students, except for special occasions. Um, they might have specific groups or uh, that are meeting for certain things. We've had that with like yearbook and a few people that are doing certain stuff. Um, but we will go on ahead and hop in. I have a meet set up here with uh, Maurice Moss from the IT crowd and everything here, you can go into your options. 
for some of those, you can record, you can open up your Jamboard here as well. Um, but if you go into your settings, you know, it has the empty calls, your captions, your video, all the standard settings. But over here on the side, you have your host controls, this little shield with the lock. And this is where you can manipulate your host settings inside. And again, with your teaching staff, this is gonna be default. Uh, they'll be able to mess with this. Um, so they can have it where their kids, whoever's in the room can't turn on their video. You can control break breakout rooms. You can make it so people can't turn on their microphone. Um, there's a lot of host controls. Google's done a really good job of adapting and adding those in as they get more requests. Um, activities. Um, everything's here uh, that you need for um, whatever you're doing, whether you're having a meeting, whether a teacher's meeting with the kids. Um, polling is kind of what we used here. It's a very straightforward. You start your poll, you know, and you can just type however many questions you want in here. You can add options. So you can keep on adding them down and then That'll launch your question. You'll have your live responses, just kind of like you saw here at the beginning of our session. And then you can choose whether to show the results or not. You can create a new poll. You can end it, trash it. Everything's there. Um, same way with the Q&A. You'll just turn on your Q&A, and this is for everybody's in there. You can allow questions here. So you can go ahead and shut that off and then have a period towards the end of whatever session where you can flip that back on. And as Google does with everything, their sorting is really, really good um, for their data. So you can sort these however you want, newest, the most popular ones. Um, you can ask a question um, in here. So there's a lot of functionality in here with the Q&A. Um, same way with recording, you know, you saw at the beginning, whenever we went down here to our settings section, you know, that we could, uh, sorry, whenever we went into our settings section that we could go ahead and record a meeting here, but it's the same thing here. You can start your recording, it'll let you know, and then you start and you'll see the record button up in the top left. And this actually saves into your drive whenever this, whenever the session's over. So any teachers that are doing any, um, meet sessions, admin, whoever is recording, that'll automatically be put into their drive. And the th also, um, we're not going to cover it today, but Google Vault, um, you can actually set a, that up to where you can save those videos um, from Drive. So that way, if um, you have an issue with a student or a teacher or something like that, you can pull those video files um, in the future. And that's actually, we've had a couple of instances where that video really save somebody. So especially if you're um, in the IT department working on the security side of things, trying to make sure that all your bases are covered, uh, that is a super handy feature uh, to have inside of Meet. So anybody have any questions on the Meet stuff? It's really straightforward. You know, you can do the whiteboard as well. You know, you can start a new Jamboard. And, you know, you can choose who you want to share it with. You can edit who has access to that. You can not give them access and you can just doodle for your own notes, um, however you want that to go. And then this is your Jamboard session. And this is going to get a lot cooler, too, as um, I've seen several people um, using the touch option on their Chromebooks to be able to just draw and doodle in here. They import math questions and then they just get their little pen and they go on ahead and doodle out the answer, show their work and everything all from the Jamboard while they're in the meet. It's super handy with, with kids, especially as you all know, they are very, very visual learners, a lot of them. Um, so just having those features at the tips of your finger, being able to go in and just show something visibly uh, to kids is really, really awesome. Jason, no questions yet. So keep on rolling, my friend. No questions. Either everybody is very content or very asleep, one or the other. <laughs> You're crushing it. <laughs> so, but there will be more meat features. Obviously, Google um, kind of hit that really heavy during post COVID because it was so important with distance learning. Um, but as we kind of go along, they're going to be integrating some more stuff into that. Oh, breakout rooms. 
can't forget breakout rooms. This is one of the most important. This was very basic when it first came out, but Google has added a lot of functionality to the breakout rooms. So the breakout rooms is literally, you will make separate rooms um, for those of you that haven't messed with it yet. Um, let's go ahead and jot something real quick. You can have as many rooms as you want. Well, it goes up to 99 rooms. So if you have more than 99, impressive um but then the cool thing about this is you have your main call and then you have your breakout rooms that you've established so you can set the number of rooms you can set the timer uh for how long the breakout room is going to last so you can you know make it like a little five minute quick hitter and uh while these rooms are going on you can actually go up and shuffle so we'll go on ahead. I don't have a second person in here right now, but we've got Maurice in the first one. So we'll go ahead and open those rooms. So it shows the breakout rooms are in session. They're gonna end in five minutes. And then you also get a 30 second courtesy timer um, whenever you get close to the end. And so the cool thing about this is as a host, you can see you know, who's assigned to what room. And you can also go in and say, I want to see how they're doing in room one. I've got it split with a couple different uh, salmon and English class. And I have a couple different groups working on separate projects. I can just go ahead and hop in. It'll throw me back into room one. And I can see everything that's going on in here. Um, I can talk, I can show video, I can start up a whiteboard, um, do all that stuff from this specific breakout room. And then whenever I'm done with that and I need to address the second group, I can just go on ahead and join their room and it'll throw me in there as soon as it decides for a second. And that's it. So that way you can kind of communicate back and forth with both of them. And then whenever you're ready, you can go on ahead and leave and it'll just return you back to the main call. And then whenever you're done, uh, say that you think everybody's good, you've checked in, you can just go ahead and close out the rooms and it'll give you that 30 second warning that the rooms are ending. And then as soon as the breakout rooms close, it'll kick everybody back out into your main room. So really, really super handy with distance learning stuff, especially whenever you're talking about groups, separate assignments. Uh, this is used very heavily for projects. Uh, like I said, we've actually had some yearbook staff and different people use this while you have different people working on different sections. Um, they'll throw the group that's working on, you know, uh, the graduation portion here, the ones that are working on pictures over here and kind of have little mini breakouts. So that way uh, you can get more done while still having everybody in the same meeting. So, all right, if we don't have any more questions. We will move on to... Google Drive. Now, the big question with Google Drive is our additions, and we're just going to go back here to our licensing page that we looked at at the top of the session. As soon as I can find the drive settings. I probably passed it three times already. Mm. Well, maybe it's up higher. Nope. Well, I'll get you that information. Um, it's on a different sheet. Uh, but basically, there's several different tiers as far as Google Drive whenever it comes to uh, storage space. And the way that works is you have, aha, here it is. So the fundamentals, you have 100 terabytes of pooled cloud storage. So that's a lot. <laughs> no, nobody in education is probably going to hit that um, unless you just have a very, very large swath of students and staff. Um, but that is the initial pool that you start out with. That's your shared for your whole domain. So as soon as you hit that, um, that's whenever you're going to hit your data cap. Um, the same way with education standard. This is one of those. Um, teaching and documentation side of things. So this really only applies to the teaching and learning upgrade. And you get 100 gigs extra per license. So that is staff and student. Uh, I believe the ratio for the licensing is four students to one staff currently. Um, but if you do that, then there's five licenses. That's an extra 500 gigabytes of storage per license. So um, if, you're, if you're doing the teaching and learning upgrade or the education plus, you really don't have any worries. While the plus, it goes down to 20 gigs per license. 
that's still a lot of data when combined with your 100 terabytes. Um, I'll let you know, I have personally not seen anyone get remotely close to that data cap. Um, and there are some other options with Google where you can kind of expand upon that. Um, but if you get there, let me know and I'll congratulate you on hitting the largest data cap I've seen. That would be truly impressive. Um, let's go through um, document approval. There's not a whole lot of stuff as far as licensing on the drive side, um, but we'll go on ahead and hit those uh, first. And the document approvals, um, this is nifty. Um, I've only seen uh, business office staff mainly use this. Um, but um, it can be used by administrators, I mean, teachers that are peer reviewing things. Um, basically, you go into your drive and you can go to a file and we'll actually get that pulled up for you real quick. I believe I already have a test doc in here. There it is. So if I go on ahead and turn on my approvals for the organization, um, allow users in my organization to request approvals, I can go in here to this doc. And I can go up to approvals. And basically what this does is I can make a request to have, you know, Maurice say, um, go in, I can type. And you can go on ahead and you can set a due date that they need to have that approval set by. So they'll get that one whenever they're notified. Um, you can allow them to edit. The, um, the standard is no editing rights, but you can allow them to edit the document for you. And then you can lock the file. So there's not any changes to it as well. Um, and this allows them to go in, review the document, look it over edit anything that needs to be edited. And then whenever the due date timer is up or you remove access, they don't have access to that anymore. Um, so anything you're looking at that might be security uh, sensitive, like um, some health record stuff or financials or different things. Um, this is really cool just because it gives you the ability to still collaborate and get some insight and editing on those documents um, without having your staff share it to everybody in the entire world. And then you have to go back later and try to fix all the sharing permissions and access um, that they've given everybody. Let's see. All right. Um, if you've been keeping track of Google updates, uh, the most recent, one of the more recent things um, that have come out have been the admin storage tools. Um, this is still very basic um, and you'll see it down here on the bottom left. If you just click on the storage icon, it's going to give you an overview of everything. Um, like I said, very basic. You can see the users with the most storage, uh, your shared drives, um, but this is very, very basic. If we go into our storage settings, um, basically this gives us the ability to limit um, what staff are able to store. I know we all have those one or two staff members that just store like uh, 100 gigabytes plus of data that is all stuff that they don't need and should have been deleted 10 years ago. Um, so you can manage you know, what, what file size we're talking about, what kind of unit you're using. Um, and then this, as of right now, is a global setting. So you can't apply it to certain groups, certain OUs yet. Um, there's a lot of settings like this that when Google initially did them, um, and that's going to ask me a password. Thanks, Google. Um, whenever they initially did a lot of the stuff, the settings were very, very limited. And then they just kind of expounded on those um, slowly but surely as the updates rolled out throughout the year. Um, and as far as being able to view storage, um, we can go in here and all this is mainly is it's your user filter, but it adds separate filters for drive usage and everything that you can go in here and you can, you know, narrow it down to like their storage status, you can, you know, add different things like that. But this is just a very, very general overview of how much data your, your staff members are actually using and your students. So, but as far as drive, that's it for now. I know that there's some additional things that are happening with the advancements that they're putting in place this year and, and uh, Q1 2023 with Classroom, um, as far as giving teachers and um, uh, curriculum directors a little bit more access to stuff 
to be a little bit more collaborative in what they do. Um, but for right now, that's pretty much the gist of it with the licensing. My district is at 50 terabyte. Nice. That is awesome. Uh, as somebody that does a lot of migrations, data migrations and email migrations, it's it's really surprising. I, I moved a guy just a few weeks ago that had over, uh, I forget what it was, like 4.5 terabytes of data. I was like, how? How? <laughs> Turns out he was also the guy that hosted all of the videos and all of the photos for the school. So it made a little bit more sense after we added in all those high quality videos. All right. So as far as drive, that's where we're at today. Um, anybody have any other questions? If not, we will go on ahead and move over to the admin console, take a peek at our time. We're still doing good. Um, this is um, kind of our bread and butter. Everything that we've talked about as far as the settings and everything inside the admin console, some of those new features, this obviously is all managed from the admin console. Um, we're going to get a little bit heavy into um, reporting and the security investigation tool. Um, these, these are things that are available with standard and plus. And let me tell you, uh, these features are super handy. There's a lot of stuff if you've dealt with GAM um, before, uh, kind of the command line version for Google. Um, you can do a lot of stuff through there, but unless you're a, a little bit of a coding script junkie, it can be a little bit complicated. Um, so just the fact that Google's added in some of these features um, with their licensing uh, really I, I can't tell you how many people just their lives have been changed from the data they're able to access with some of these new features. Um, so to start off, we're just gonna go into the security section over here on the side. And again, this is where we live. Now I will take sometimes this tab can get stuck. Sometimes it's a little bit annoying, but um, if you just go out and back in, it usually fixes itself. So there's a pro tip for the day of somebody that deals with it literally every day of my life. Um, if we go to the security center, we can go down to the dashboard and this just gives us a lot of data. Of course, you know, Google gives us a lot of filtering, uh, reference points. Um, if you have multiple domains, different time zones, um, it lets you block out a lot of different things. And so these are super handy because it also links directly to your reporting data, um, that you have available with you over on the side under reporting. And so if we go to like our spam filter, obviously this is a demo domain, so you're not gonna be getting a whole lot of that, um, but let you know how much mails come in, how much of it's spam. And if we go to our report, we can see a little bit more of a breakdown, but the real awesome thing is down here at the bottom is you're able to sort all of this stuff by, um, you know, what was sent, what was spam, who the recipient was, um, you know, the sender domain, um, the reason that it was marked as spam. Um, you can go in and you can actually go over here and you can create a new investigation, which we'll get into in just a second. But all of this data links to something in the investigation tool. So if I wanted to know uh, specifically about this past user action one, I can just click on here and it's going to go on ahead and pop up and populate all my data for uh, the investigation log. And so now I can go in here, I can see this particular email, you know, I can show what actions I want to take, um, whether I want to restore it, mark it as spam, phishing, put it in quarantine. Uh, if you just click on it, It'll actually pull up this box um, that gives you your raw header information as well as the other information. Um, and you can even go through specifically. So I can put testing for presentation. And this will actually let me see the message. So I can see exactly what it is so I can get a better eye on whether it's actually spam, whether it's something I need to go back in and mark as not spam, uh, restore it, um, in the same way here, if there's several that you get into, you can also look at the entirety of the thread. Um, so this is obviously one message, um, but if there were multiple ones, you could go on ahead down through here and mark these. And this lets you go on ahead and restore the messages, delete them, mark a spam. 
um, send it to the inbox. So usually you'll have this where somebody says that they're getting something that's spam and you can go on ahead and just shoot it back to their inbox. And that saves you the hassle of telling them to look in their spam folder <laughs> or any of that. Um, it just puts it right in their lap so you don't have to worry about it. Um, which leads us into uh, the investigation tool. So the security dashboard, you know, that we went over, there's a whole bunch of stuff here um, to unpack, you know, whether it's message delivery, messages that have been rejected. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do um, with the investigation tool with, um, we won't go into it today, but um, getting into um, your reporting as far as your email log search. Um, those of you that deal with email headaches, that is super, super helpful. Um, it's available in fundamentals as well. Um, so you don't have to have the licensing for that. But having everything here in the reports is kind of a quick, handy way that you can get in. It gives you a breakdown of everything, even your spam filtering, whether it was a phishing attempt, malware, um, whether you had some spoofing going on, um, if you don't have, you know, DMARC DKIM set up, and a few different things. Um, there's just a ton of data in here. Um, this is one of my favorites dealing with stuff on the back end is OAuth, like who's been authorizing apps. <laughs> <laughs> um, then this is something security wise, um, as an administrator, you want to keep an eye on, um, just because I've seen some pretty quirky stuff, um, get authorized. Um, usually you want to go into your settings in the admin console and change who's allowed to make those authorizations. Um, but if for some reason you've getting some weird stuff going on, like people, um, their calendar all of a sudden is showing spam on every single day of their calendar um, that an external uh, user has hijacked their OAuth consent to uh, <laughs> start dumping everything on their calendar. We've had that happen a couple of times at a few different clients. So um, this is somewhere where you can go and just, you know, view the reports, you know, also it gives you, you know, additional information about what app was using it and how many grants and everything. Like obviously syscloud security is legitimate, so you're gonna be getting a lot of it, but you can even break it down into the specific API scope that it's using. Um, so this might be a little bit uh, above some people that haven't really dealt with that, but if you're dealing with stuff on the back end with APIs, this is really, really, really handy um, just because you can go in and you can nix access to specific APIs. So especially if you have a couple of different programs that are giving you some issues that are that are hijacking some attempts on different APIs, you can just go and shut those down. And um, yeah, and you can do it by user. This one's really handy because there's always those one or two people that are responsible for most of it, but um, you can go through the users here. So just a lot of data and the same thing, you know, all of these have this new investigation tool magnifying glass here and it populates the data for you. So you don't have to worry about it. It makes life so, so, so much easier. Um, you can go in, you can see a description, gives you all the data you know, teacher to authorized access, um, basically everything you need to kind of track, track things down. And also I wanted to show whenever we looked at that email message earlier in the investigation tool here, um, if you go to your reporting, um, if you'll remember, I actually went in and um, gave it a reason for me to view the message. So Everything in Google is logged. If it's not in the admin console, it didn't happen. I've had a lot of people say, oh, the password changed. No, it didn't. It would be inside the admin console. If it hits Google, it's audited and logged. And so you can see everything. So we can actually go and see where I was performing OAuth queries, where I looked at different levels of security. I asked for content access um, into this Gmail account. And you can actually see the justification testing for presentation. So you'll be able to see who accessed specific email, um, who, what the reasoning for, um, for that was. And so that's really handy as far as being able to give people access to some of the stuff from your tech team, but also it helps you to be able to avoid abuse um, from a lot of that stuff. And as you'll see, everything here inside the investigation tool has these little three bubbles. So if I wanted something just specifically investigating content access into people's emails, I can actually just pivot to an event 
it goes ahead and fills it out for me. And then I can see every time that content access has been has been approved inside of there. So it really helps you cover everything, uh, especially we run into some instances where some staff members um, might not like particular IT people and they'll try to say they've been looking at my email and all this and that. And you can actually go in here and you can see along with everything else you can go into and see when the user's account was accessed, which machine the user's account was being accessed from. Um, but the investigation tool is just um, super handy. So what we're going to do is we're going to and delete all that. And I want to kind of give you the investigation tool um, overview since we're already in here. And so if you go to your security and your security center, you're going to see that investigation tool. And it does take a little bit of time to populate um, sometimes just because of the sheer amount of data that it's wading through, because this is all of the data that you have in your domain that hasn't been archived off. <laughs> into vault um it is setting here so there's a lot here we were just in those admin logs where you can see pretty much anything an admin user is doing inside google admin um you can go on ahead and get that taken care of um you can view all that stuff chrome log events chat this is super handy this is a newer one um, normally students don't have chat turned on. We had an instance a couple weeks ago where a school accidentally turned on chat and the students took a massive advantage of it. And then they had a couple of instances where there was abuse. So we could actually go in. Um, I don't have any chat data in here, um, but you can actually go in and you can add the condition, um, you know, by anything recipients. If you know the room ID, if you know the date, um, whether there were attachments submitted, um, you know, I can go in here and, you know, I can go into Maurice here, even though he doesn't have any chat stuff. And this will actually go in here and search. And just like before, it'll display all those down here and you can click on them and give yourself access to see specifically what um, <laughs> the the kids, staff members, whoever we're talking about. So, and all this stuff is logged as well inside vault so google is super super good about making sure all your data is there um, you can access it um i i can't even tell you the number of times that using the investigation log already has saved staff members that i work with a lot of headache um it's 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 been super incredibly helpful um we'll kind of just skim over it real quick um, you can go to Gmail log events, drive log events. Um, for those of you that work with students that say, I keep on creating it and it keeps on disappearing. It keeps on deleting itself. You can actually go into the drive log events and you can see when that wonderful little child deleted their stuff. Uh, you can see what computer it came from. Uh, you can see if it was never created in the first place. Um, so yeah, we've had that more than once um, where you get an angry staff member that says, well, this is just deleting every time. You have to check this out. And then you check it out and little Billy's been deleting them all. Um, but yeah, security investigation tool, super powerful. There's a lot of stuff you can do. And I mean, it gets down into like your keep notes um, and different things like that. So uh, take out events at the end of the year when your seniors are moving off their data, you can see what's been done there. Um, it's a super powerful tool. And they honestly, it seems like every month they add something new to it. Um, Let's go into notice that one of the things on here was our context aware access. And this is just another layer of security. Um, basically, um, what context aware access does is you can kind of we'll go ahead and turn it on, but you can create different access levels for different things. So um, you can create conditions for applications uh, that they have where you can go on ahead and make, you know. Um, particular geographic location, such as, you know, we can make it, if it would let me type in a U, which it's not going to. Mm -hmm. The United States. Um, so we can go on ahead and make a, um, a condition applies if they meet that attribute or if they don't meet that attribute. Um, you can kind of geolocate with a bunch of this. So if you had specific things where you only wanted people to be able to access that application from the United States, 
um, that's really good. So in case you're not using two-step verification or somebody's able to get around that and is accessing that data, if they're coming in from another country, um, it will block that access attempt um, for the app. So you can add there, you can add conditions, you can add another attribute to that. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do. It's super powerful. Um, they also have a lot of stuff that is um, custom uh, that they built into it. So you can actually go in here and you can filter out a lot of things with mail as far as um, having uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers, all of that stuff. You can actually set that up in the mail section to make it so that it automatically filters out all that stuff. Uh, student health information for the United States, international health information. It'll go ahead and filter that all out and you can actually set up notifications so you're notified whenever that gets blocked off. Um, the security sandbox. Um, this is a pretty handy tool. Oh, go ahead. Minute. Sorry, I was waiting for a good minute to interrupt. There's actually a question in here and I just wanted to make sure it got answered. Okay, I'm so up. from um, one of our attendees, they said that they've had a few teachers who use Google Meet to record lessons, even if they don't have students joining the Meet. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently, the Meets have been started. Um, the Meets have started to end automatically if nobody else joins. They're wondering if this is something that could be done on the Google admin side. Um, honestly, I am not sure on that. I don't think that they have a setting in there yet. I know that whenever you're inside of it, it gives you the option yourself uh, to not cancel that. Um, let me see. We have that on our host controls. I'm actually, I can actually get an answer to that for you, but I'm not entirely sure where that is right now. And I don't think they've added that in because that's fairly new. But yes, I know that there's a pop up and it asks you, you know, hey, you're in the session, would you like to, you know, go on ahead and set it out. And I don't think that it's in there. It would be under, under the main section with streaming, but I know that there, it was not in and they had people that were requesting it. Um, so it is something that has actually been requested and, um, as soon as we get an update on that, I can let them know. But okay. as far as I know, no, there is nothing in the admin side. It's exclusively whenever you go into the user side and do that. Okay. Unless there's something new that I haven't seen yet. Thanks so much. No problem. Do we have any other ones? I kind of missed a few here. No, I think that was the only no. one. Okay. Perfect. All right, let's see. Go back to our security sandbox. Um, just in general, um, Gmail, there are a lot of features in here, uh, everything ranging from spam, um, advanced routing. Um, there, there's just the toolkit inside here is huge. Um, so if you have some questions about that, there's something specifically um, that you kind of have, you know, inquiries about whether it's creating custom rules for disabled users. So people are getting that email and it's not bouncing like it typically does with suspended users. Um, routing um, best practices for spam. Um, we see a lot of email allow list here. Um, you don't want to do that. <laughs> if you can avoid it, because if that IP ever gets switched to anywhere else, that server gets taken over, then you just whitelisted your entire domain to whatever spam is going to be coming out of there. Um, so just a, just a friendly tip while we're, while we're going through here. Um, and then security sandbox um, basically is what it says. This will be some additional scanning that comes in um, for everybody, and this is organizational unit based, so you can turn it on or off for different OUs. Um, but basically, it's malware, ransomware, a lot of that stuff that we saw in the reporting section that we were going through, um, zero day threats, different stuff like that. It scans a lot of that whenever it goes through. So, this actually is pretty handy. It picks up 
quite a bit. Um, you can create additional sandbox rules inside of here um, if you want to be a little bit more specific about some of the stuff that's happening. Um, it gets a little bit more advanced um, with those rules whenever you're setting that up. Um, but it is really handy. And of course, here's a link to the security center for those reports that we were looking at a little bit earlier. Um, two last things I kind of want to go over um, are, let me go ahead and pull this up real quick. Um, GCPW, which is um, Google Credential Provider for Windows. Uh, those of you that still have are trying to go fully Chrome, and are stuck on you have several staff windows machines um, this is actually really 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 handy what this does is it basically sets up authentication to google to log in on your windows computer um, so basically it turns your windows computer into you know kind of a chromebook except you're using the windows os and also there's um, device management on the back end for this. So once you have this set up on a machine, you can actually go and you can apply group policy and stuff through Google. Um, you can, you know, change your updates, uh, every pretty much a lot of the stuff that you have the ability to do using standard GPOs um, and Active Directory, you can actually do um, here inside Google. And that list is growing all the time. We've actually done that in a couple of different places. We're getting ready to do one, I think here on the 23rd. And uh, it's nice. You can go ahead and roll over the profiles. So you don't have to worry about deleting their, moving all their O profile stuff over manually. Um, and you can set up drive for desktop. And essentially it's a Chromebook, except it's Windows. Um, I'm super handy. So if you have you know, a small group of staff members that are still, you know, clinging on to stuff or they have Windows specific applications that they're still using and they have to have those Windows machines, but you want them in Google, um, that can all be done through GCPW. And that's um, with, you have to have Windows 10 professional um, or the education or, or education um, to use GCPW on those machines. You can't have standard or any of that. So there's, we, we saw that list of what's required. There's also a few other extra things that, that are, uh, are required as well, um, being able to uh, do some of the different things like uh, GCPW. And then the last thing we'll kind of hit on is Workspace Migrate. Um, so again, support articles here, friends, um, because we've had some people inquire about doing this and they have different systems. If it's not listed on the spec sheet for Google about what's able to migrate, it does not work. You can't make it work. If you did by the grace of the almighty, it would uh, be really bad, painful. Um, the good thing about doing this, doing the migration work through Google is there's actually logging for that. So you can go back through in your, and check your reports. You can see all the logging and everything, um, works you through all the system requirements and everything, you know, basically you go through and, you know, you get started and you can go ahead and um, go through all the initial questions. Uh, always, always, always read these, no matter what you're working through, um, because there are some things that you will miss. Uh, the first time I did a GCPW install, I thought that it was all good to go. Got to the day before, was reading back over some of the paperwork, and lo and behold, there was a major glaring issue that I missed that was in the support article. Uh, Google does a pretty good job of updating these. They might be a few days behind, but in general, they're all pretty fairly up to date. Um, and there's, and this is the more advanced version, you know, it gives you the supported features and everything up top, uh, as with all other support articles, but, um, there's also the little free version that you've probably seen. Um, if you go into account and then data migration, this is really handy if you want to move some little one-off accounts here and there. But if you're migrating from an entire domain like Office 365 or Outlook over to Google, uh, you definitely want to have your licensing so you can use the uh, workspace migrate. Uh, it'll save you a lot of headache. So, but other than that, um, I think we've just about covered everything. Oh, um, one thing I wanted to go through, I don't know how many of you are actually using the advanced mobile management. Um, but here is a cheat sheet. 
<laughs> that tells you this is one of those ones that's not listed on the original licensing page, but it shows you basic management for your mobile devices like iOS and Android. Um, not a lot of people are using uh, this to manage school devices because most of it's personal. Uh, but if you are um, getting into the advanced management side, it shows you what requires the licensing. So like, you know, your passcode enforcement, iOS app management, work profiles, different security stuff, basically all the major important things that you need if you're genuinely trying to secure and manage uh, mobile devices, uh, you're really gonna want that advanced management. It's kind of like if you have a Chromebook and don't get a management licenses, license, you're gonna have a bad day <laughs> because you're not gonna have all those management features that make your life easier. So, but other than that, I think I've just about covered everything, um, Mr. Billy Bass. Um, yeah. So, I, do you see I any think questions? we're pretty good here. No, Jason, I don't see any other questions. We'll uh, leave uh, some time for folks to ask anything, but Jocelyn, otherwise, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. All some really great content here, and I appreciate you guys' this time. Um, Camille, I didn't know if you have the survey, if we want to put that in the chat. We do usually ask um, for individuals who have joined to, to complete the survey for any feedback. We like to hear um, your thoughts and how you thought this overall webinar went and any suggestions for the future. Um, so let's see if we could just pull that up quickly. And then it will be in the chat once either Camille or I find it first. <laughs> and if you fill out this survey, if you haven't already from some of the past sessions, there is a chance to win or to get a raffle of some Google swag. So there is that if you take a few minutes, just fill out those few questions. Oops, and I just need to make sure I send it to everybody. All right, here we go. All right, so there you go. You can find it right there. So again, if there are just a few questions, we just want to hear your feedback. Um, and then on top of it, so these are our admin sessions and this is our last one wrapping up the Google Workspace for Education series. However, we are also doing um, some teacher sessions for Google Workspace for Education. So we had our first one last week, we'll have our next one tomorrow, um, and then we have another one the next week. So that's something that you could share over the registration for to your teachers and staff. Um, if they're interested in attending. Uh, Jocelyn? Sure. I have, Billy, I might steal the screen from you for just one second because I realized I talked about it, but I wanted to make sure that I showed everybody uh, to kind of answer that question. Whenever you're inside your meet here, if you go on ahead down to your little settings button and go to your settings, um, in general is where you would uncheck that leave empty calls. So that way it keeps it from removing the call. So you can do that per meet, but as far as I know, you can't do that from the admin console yet. So just kind of piggyback off our question we had a little bit earlier. Awesome. And then I'm just pulling up the registration quickly. So again, sending this through the chat, this is the registration link for the teacher side of the Google Workspace for Education um, teacher series. So again, feel free to share that um, and then just stay tuned for any more upcoming webinars from us. Thanks so much for joining guys. We appreciate your attendance.